Welcome to lesson number two, The Central Issue, Love or Selfishness, ready for teaching on April 13. It's from the series on the Great Controversy, written by Mark Finley, and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 6. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we're reading your word this week, that it opens to us through the words, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the writers of those words, and from you, that we know that Jesus is coming soon. And we also know that the plan of salvation allows each of us to have the opportunity of being with you for eternity but also to have our sins cleansed, to have our lives changed, and to give us hope, not just for now, but for the future. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your spirit will be with us, that we will grow each one of us, and that our confidence in you will grow day by day. And as we study day by day, Lord, I pray that not only will we grow, but we'll be able to share with those about us. And today I'd particularly like to pray for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Salt Lake City who are currently looking for a new pastor, for Nadine Murray and her father. I don't know their circumstances, Lord, but they need prayer at this time. And for those who are sighted or who are sightless or unable to read, those who want to listen to the Word, who listen to this podcast, Lord, as we read the Sabbath school lesson and the attended Bible texts, we pray that each one of us may be blessed. And then especially for Daisy Mathendi and her family in Malawi. Lord, you know their needs. And for Anthony Allen and his needs too, Lord, we pray that as we open your word, not only will we be blessed, but we will come to love Jesus more and more. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's read that again. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Suppose you are a herdsman tending your goats on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem. You hear voices. Immediately you recognize the voice of Jesus. As the setting sun gleams off the temple and reflects in snowy whiteness off its magnificent marble walls, Jesus emphatically states in Matthew 24 verse 2, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. The disciples are confused, and so are you. What could Jesus possibly mean by these words? How do they relate to the end of the world that Jesus' disciples asked about? You listen in rapt attention as Jesus masterfully blends events that would lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem with those that would take place just before his return. In the destruction of Jerusalem, we discover a foreshadowing of Satan's strategy both to deceive and destroy God's people at the end time. Jesus' instruction in Matthew 24 clearly outlines last day events in the context of Jerusalem's fall. We will study Satan's twofold strategy both to deceive and destroy God's people. What the evil one fails to accomplish, though, through persecution, he hopes to achieve through compromise. God is never caught by surprise, and even in the most challenging times, He preserves His people. Sunday, April 7, A Broken-Hearted Saviour As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem, His heart was broken. John's Gospel says, 
he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John 1 verse 11. Jesus did everything he could to save his people from the coming destruction of their beloved city. Jesus' love for his people flowed from a heart of infinite love. He repeatedly appealed to them in love to repent and accept his gracious invitation of mercy. Read Luke 19, 41-44, Matthew 23, 37 and 38, and John 5, verse 40. What do these verses tell you about Jesus' attitude toward his people and their response to his loving invitation of grace and mercy? What revelation of God's character do you see? So, first of all, Luke 19, beginning at verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And Matthew 23, beginning at verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I would have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. And John 5, verse 40, Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. It is difficult to understand such an event as the destruction of Jerusalem in the light of God's loving character. History reveals that tens of thousands died as the Roman general Titus led his armies against the city. Jerusalem was devastated. Men, women and children were slaughtered. Where was God when his people suffered so greatly? The answer is clear, but not easy to grasp fully. God's heart was broken. His eyes were filled with tears. For centuries he reached out to his people. By their rebellion against his loving kindness, they forfeited his divine protection. God does not always intervene to limit the results of his people's choices. He allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. God did not cause the slaughter of innocent children in the destruction of Jerusalem. The tragic death of the innocents was Satan's act, not God's. Satan delights in war because it stirs the worst passions of the human heart. Down through the centuries, it has been his purpose to deceive and destroy and then blame his evil actions on God. Read Matthew 24, verses 15 to 20. What instruction did Jesus give his people to save them from the coming destruction of Jerusalem? Matthew 24, beginning at verse 15. So, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then... Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back and get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. It is well to remember that the vast majority of Christians living in Jerusalem in AD 70 came from a Jewish background. A loving God desired to preserve as many of his people as possible. That is why he gave the instruction that when the Roman armies approached, they were to flee the city. And so to finish today, reflect on the following statement. We do not judge God's character by events we see around us. Rather, we filter all the events we see through the prism of his loving character as revealed in the Bible. Why is this such good counsel? 
I'll repeat it again. We do not judge God's character by events we see around us. Rather, we filter all the events we see through the prism of his loving character as revealed in the Bible. Monday, April 8, Christians Providentially Preserved God's mercy, grace, providence and foreknowledge are clearly revealed in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Cestius Gaulus and the Roman armies surrounded the city. In an unexpected move, when their attack seemed imminent, they withdrew. The Jewish armies pursued them and won a great victory. With the Romans fleeing and the Jews pursuing, the Christians in Jerusalem fled to Pella in Perea, beyond the Jordan River. The promised sign, Ellen White wrote in The Great Controversy, page 30, had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Saviour's warning. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Read Psalm 46 verse 1 and Isaiah 41 verse 10. What do these passages tell us about God's providential care? Psalm 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And Isaiah 41 verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is sovereign and overrules events on earth for the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purposes. Although at times God alters his original plans based on our human choices, his ultimate plan for this planet will be fulfilled. There will be times when the people of God experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment and death itself for the cause of Christ. But even in the most challenging of these times with Satan's most vicious attacks, God sustains and preserves his church. Read Hebrews 11, 35-38 and Revelation 2, verse 10. What reality do these texts reveal about our battle with the forces of evil? How do these passages harmonize with the idea of God's protection in the previous question? Is there a contradiction in the idea of God's protection and God allowing some to face painful suffering and even a martyr's death for the cause of of Christ. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 35, women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They even went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. And Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the Church of Christ by violence, we read in the Great Controversy, page 41. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat, they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. End of quote. And so to finish today. What should it mean to us that the Bible writers, who certainly knew pain and suffering, could nevertheless again and again write about the reality of God's love? How can we experience that same love for ourselves?
Tuesday, April 9, Faithful Amid Persecution Throughout the early centuries of Christianity, the Christian Church grew rapidly despite imprisonment, torture and persecution. Faithful believers, totally committed to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaimed His Word with power. Lives were changed and tens of thousands were converted. Read Acts chapter 2, verse 41, chapter 4, verses 4 and 31, chapter 5, verse 42, and chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. What do these verses teach us about the challenges the New Testament church faced and also why it grew so rapidly? First of all, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And Acts chapter 4 verse 4. But many who heard the messages believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. And Acts 4 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And chapter 8 verses 1 to 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. The disciples faced threats, as we read in Acts 4.17. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. The disciples faced imprisonment, as you read in Acts 5, 17 to 18. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. The disciples faced persecution, as we read in verse 1 of chapter 8. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And the disciples faced death itself. As we read in Acts 7, 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Acts chapter 12, verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Yet, in the power of the Holy Spirit, courageously proclaimed the resurrected Christ, and churches multiplied throughout Judea, Galilee, and and Samaria, as you read in Acts 9 and verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. The bastions of hell were shaken. The shackles of Satan were broken. Pagan superstition crumbled before the power of the resurrected Christ. The gospel triumphed in the face of overwhelming odds. The disciples no longer cowered in the upper room. Fear danced away like a fading shadow. Instead, faith filled the disciples' hearts. One glimpse of their resurrected Lord changed their lives. Jesus gave them a new reason for living. 
Our Lord had not only given them the great commission in Mark 16.15, but the great promise of Acts 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Mark 16.15 reads, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The gospel penetrated the remotest corners of the earth, as we read in Colossians 1.23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Although the last of the disciples, John, died at the end of the first century, Others picked up the torch of truth and proclaimed the living Christ. Pliny the Younger, governor of the Roman province of Bithynia on the north coast of modern Turkey, wrote to Emperor Trajan around AD 110. Pliny's statement is significant because it was nearly 80 years after the crucifixion. Pliny described the official trials he was conducting to find and execute Christians. He stated, For many persons of all ages and classes and of both sexes are being put in peril by accusation, and this will go on. The contagion of this superstition, that's Christianity, has spread not only in the cities, but in the villages and rural districts as well. And that's Henry Bettersonson, writing in Documents of the Christian Church, published by Oxford University Press in 2011, and that was on page four. Despite the devil's most vicious attacks, the Christian church grew rapidly. And so to finish the day, what can we learn from the early church that could help us, the end time church? Wednesday, April 10, Caring for the Community The early Christian church grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they lived the gospel. Believers modelled the ministry of Christ, who went about all Galilee, as we read in Matthew 4.23, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Jesus deeply cared for people, and so did the New Testament church. It was this unselfish love and commitment to meeting human needs, combined with sharing the good news of the gospel in the Holy Spirit's power, that made such an impact on the world in the early centuries of the Christian church. Read Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47, chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, and chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Although circumstances vary, what principles can we learn from these passages about authentic Christianity? First of all, Acts 2, beginning at verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And chapter 3 of Acts, verses 6 to 9, Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God, when all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews 
among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. These New Testament believers followed the model of Christ, who, as Peter expressed it in Acts 10.37, was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Christ's church was his body on earth, and it too, in these early centuries, expressed Christ's sacrificial love and concern for hurting, broken humanity. These believers were living examples of Christ's compassion. In the great controversy raging in the universe, the devil wants to deface the image of God in humanity. The purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of God in humanity. This restoration includes physical, mental, emotional and spiritual healing. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus reveals his plan for each one of us. It reads, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He longs for us to be physically healthy, mentally alert, emotionally stable and spiritually whole. This is especially true in the light of his promised return. This world is facing an enormous crisis. Jesus' own predictions in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 foretell catastrophic conditions on the earth before his return. When Christ touches us with his healing grace, we long to touch others with the touch of Christ so that they may be made whole. Jesus sends us out into a broken world as ambassadors for Christ to touch others with his love. New Testament Christianity was characterised by the Christians' love for one another and their communities. So to finish today, discuss what role does the church have in cooperating with Christ in proving Satan's charges are wrong? Thursday, April 11, A Legacy of Love Read John 13, verse 35 and 1 John 4, 21. What do these passages reveal about Satan's challenge against the government of God in the Great Controversy? What do they tell us about the essence of genuine Christianity? John 13, verse 35 By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And First John chapter 4 and verse 21. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Love was the norm of Christian communities in the first few centuries. Tertullian, an early Christian theologian, claimed, it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that led many to put a brand upon us. See, they say, how they love one another. That's from chapter 29 of In Apology, translated by S. Thelwell, and is available on the list in the internet. It uh, was 
accessed in October 10, 2022. One of the greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics plagued the early centuries around A.D. 160 and A.D. 260. Christians stepped forward and ministered to the sick and dying. These plagues killed tens of thousands and left entire villages and towns with scarcely an inhabitant. The unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians made a huge impact on the population. Over time, thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands and then millions in the Roman Empire became believers in Jesus during these two epidemics. Love, outgoing concern and organised selfless care of the sick and dying created an admiration for these believers and the Christ they represented. Rodney Stark's The Rise of Christianity is a modern historical narrative portraying these historic events in a new and improved light. In it, he describes how during the second epidemic, the whole Christian community, which was still heavily Judeo-Christian, became a virtual army of nurses providing the basic needs for the suffering community to survive. He writes... At the height of the second great epidemic, around AD 260, Dionysius wrote a lengthy tribute to the heroic nursing efforts of local Christians, many of whom lost their lives while caring for others. Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbours and cheerfully accepting their pains. That's from The Rise of Christianity, published by Princeton University Press in 1996 and from page 82. And so to finish today, what is the obvious message for us here? How do we learn to die to self so that we too can manifest this same selfless spirit? It's not easy, is it? Friday, April 12. Further thought. The gospel continued to spread and the number of its adherents to increase. It penetrated into regions that were inaccessible even to the eagles of Rome. Said a Christian, expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution, You may kill us, torture us, condemn us. Your injustice is the proof that we are innocent, nor does your cruelty avail you. It was but a stronger invitation to bring others to their persuasion. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. And that's from Tertullian in Apology, paragraph 50, quoted by Ellen White in The Great Controversy, pages 41 and 42. And then from page 47 of The Great Controversy, we read... The mysterious providence which permits the righteous to suffer persecution at the hand of the wicked has been a cause of great perplexity to many who are weak in the faith. Some are even ready to cast away their confidence in God because he suffers the basest of men to prosper, while the best and purest are afflicted and tormented by their cruel power. How, it is asked... Can one who is just and merciful and who is also infinite in power tolerate such injustice and oppression? This is a question with which we have nothing to do. God has given us sufficient evidence of his love and we are not to doubt his goodness because we cannot understand the workings of his providence. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, What value does persecution serve? Why do you think God allows his people to suffer at times? 
And though, in some cases, such as in the early church, good was able to come of it, what about times when it appears that nothing good has come from it? Why, in situations like this, is the personal experience of God's love so important in order to maintain faith? And two, how would you respond if a friend asked you these questions? Where is God in my suffering? If he loves me, why am I going through such a difficult time? And question three. How can your local church become a caring community to impact the world? Discuss practical ways to apply this week's study. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Faithful Gymnast in Italy by Andrew McChesney Seven-year-old Sarah loved gymnastics. It was easy for her, and she was good at it. She especially liked doing cartwheels. She could do cartwheel after cartwheel in a row, and she only stopped when she fell down. But there was something that Sarah loved even more than gymnastics. She loved God. So, she was not tempted to skip church when the gymnastics coach announced that a major gymnastics show would be held on the Sabbath in her hometown of Isai, Italy. The show only took place once a year and children would show off what they had been learning to their parents and families. Sarah felt sad when the coach said the show had been scheduled for the Sabbath. At home, Mother saw Sarah's downcast face. God can solve any problem, she said. She suggested that Sarah could take her Sabbath problem to God. That evening, Sarah prayed, Dear God, I am very sad to hear the news that I will miss the show, but your will be done. Sarah and the other children met for gymnastics practice every Tuesday and Thursday. The coach had announced the date for the gymnastics show at a Tuesday practice. Sarah prayed on Tuesday night and on Wednesday night. At the Thursday practice, the coach suddenly announced that the date for the gymnastics show had been changed. We have to postpone the show by one day, until Sunday, because of some organisational problems, she said. Sarah couldn't believe her ears. She was ecstatic with joy. When she excitedly broke the news to Mother a short time later, Mother smiled bigger than the sun. You have to trust God always, she said. And Sarah always has. This was her first experience with prayer, and it greatly strengthened her faith in God. On Sabbath, she told the church about what had happened. A church member prepared a special sermon about the prayer and invited Sarah onto the platform to tell her story. I have always prayed when facing problems in life, Sarah, now 19, told Adventist Mission. The mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number seven of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to help youth and young adults place God first. For more information, you can go to the website at iwillgo2020.org. Read more about Sarah's story next week. <laughs> 